Uh, it's, uh, I'm Larry Diamond. I uh, co-lead the uh, Arab Reform and Democracy Program with Hisham Salam. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event, which is serving two purposes. It's the latest in our series of uh, uh, seminars for the Arab Reform and Democracy Program, but it is also kicking off a uh, remarkable week of events to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, of which the Arab Reform and Democracy Program uh, is a part. Uh, I want to thank um, that Hisham, <laughs> uh, Hisham Salam, for uh, his work in arranging this event, but also uh, our remarkable CDDRL staff, particularly Kristen Chandler and Nora Sulatz, who are with us uh, today. Um, and I'm particularly glad that uh, our speaker, uh, Muli Hisham Alawi, is going to be with us for the week and uh, joining us for the 20th anniversary uh, celebrations of the uh, Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law later this week. I think you will have found uh, a book on your chair and uh, that book is for you, and uh, we hope you uh, take it, uh, appreciate it, and uh, feel free to uh, cite it uh, and uh, review it uh, if you'd like. Uh, I would like to say uh, about this book before I introduce um, our speaker that um, I think uh, it is a remarkable uh, piece of work. It is, to my knowledge, the first serious scholarly effort to apply and interrogate theories of democratization uh, to uh, the uh, extraordinary and historic uh, transitions that emerged uh, during the period of the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening, whatever you call it. And the, um, not to steal the thunder of our speaker, but the Arab Spring, Spring created a kind of natural experiment. There were uh, multiple uh, transitions uh, ignited by these protests, and probably the two most important and promising ones uh, were in uh, Egypt uh, and Tunisia. Uh, and I think this is really uh, an imaginative and intensively researched uh, through an extraordinary range of uh, interviews uh, and analysis of all kinds of documents uh, of these two transitions uh, in light of um, uh, theories of uh, democratization and uh, political negotiations or, or pacts. I'm not going to give away uh, his analysis and conclusions, but I am going to say that I consider this book to be a, a very distinguished and important contribution, not only to the study uh, of democracy uh, and democratic prospects in the Middle East, but also to the study of democratization itself. And <laughs> if I can just have a word of immodesty, uh, I'm very proud that that contribution has been made by a former student of mine who was in one of the first uh, classes I taught uh, on uh, democratization uh, here at Stanford University, let's say some few years ago, Muli Hisham. So uh, Hisham Malawi, uh, I will now introduce as the founder and director of the Hisham Malawi Foundation, which undertakes innovative social scientific research in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, he is a scholar uh, of, uh, I think now, really uh, important significance on the comparative politics of both democratization and religion uh, with a focus on the MENA region. Uh, we can now call him uh, in the wake of um, uh, obtaining his DPhil, which this book is the culmination of, from the University of Oxford, uh, 
Dr. Alawi, uh, and I'm pleased to see that another D. Phil from Oxford has just joined us uh, in that distinguished uh, tradition. Hisham Alawi has been a visiting scholar and consulting professor here at CDDRL, and he has also served as a postdoctoral fellow and research associate uh, at Harvard University. He was a Regents lecturer at several campuses in the University of California system, and he has worked uh, as a practitioner as well with the United Nations in various capacities, including the peacekeeping mission in Kosovo. He's also worked with the uh, Carter Center in Atlanta in its overseas missions on conflict resolution, uh, election monitoring, and democracy advancement. He's been on the MENA Advisory Committee of Human Rights Watch, the Advisory Board of the Carnegie Endowments Middle East Center, and most importantly, perhaps, he's been on the advisory board of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford, and recently joined the advisory board of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard. In addition to um, his DPhil from Oxford, he has an AB from Princeton University and a master's degree from Stanford University. So uh, Hisham, thank you for returning to your alma mater to talk about this uh, intellectually exciting and very significant book, Pact of Democracy in the Middle East. And I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Larry, for that uh, kind introduction. And it, it, it means a lot to be back for me on this campus. Not only it's my alma mater, and not only is it a place uh, where I, this all began in, 90, in 1995, and you referred to your, uh, to your seminar, which you were teaching, because I remember at the, at the Hoover Institution on the second floor on the <laughs> library. I remember that very well. But beyond that, I spent some years here thinking about these issues in 95. And, uh, way after 95, when CDDRL just begun. And I, um, many of this thinking, gestation of this thinking started precisely on this campus. So I'm very, I'm very happy to come back uh, home, so to speak, to, uh, to present this book. So uh, as you'll see, uh, this, this book is offered to a, to a rising young uh, uh, generation of democratic advocates in the Middle East and North Africa. These are thinkers, activists, practitioners who never stop inspiring me. And uh, for they now carry the torch of uh, advancing freedom and change in our region. Uh, I deliberately use these, voice because, these words because I think we're at a lull now. We are at a moment of respite where everybody is taking stock of what happened in 2011 through 2013. And I don't think that this is a, uh, a political, gener a, a biological generation as much as a political generation. I don't think we'll wait 25 years before we see, uh, uh, before we see new rumblings and new pressure from above. This is why I call it a, a political generation. It is not the sons that will be inspired or will excavate, you know, will have the memory of their, of their parents, but rather the younger brother who will have remembered his older brother, his older sister, having gone to the streets of Cairo or Tunisia and, uh, and uh, participated in these uh, peaceful movements. Uh, so this book is about uh, democracy in uh, MENA. And regretfully, the debate about democracy in MENA was basically hijacked or basically seen almost exclusive, exclusively through the prism of Islam and democracy. And this uh, oriental trope has essentially uh, uh, marginalized all other type of debates and the question became, is Islam compatible with democracy? And here you have two views. You have one view uh, articulated, 
by uh, loudly and sometimes persuasively by skeptics like uh, Bernard Lewis who argue that Islam is allergic or shall I say even averse to secularism and thus democratization requires a separation of politics and religion and as such you cannot expect democracy in this region because of this, this fundamental flaw or this fundamental reality. And this feeds New York Orientalist projects claiming to reform or civilize Islam first, which are for me a historical reductionism. And carried to their extreme was of course the neoconservative view of the region that something is deeply flawed with the Arab psyche and the Arab psychology and basically uh, to push start democracy you needed basically it went to extremes to even require an, uh, an intervention and it wasn't by luck that Bernard Lewis was essentially the primary or one of the essential uh, advisors to both the political leadership of the neocons and also to the Pentagon during uh, during the time leading to the American intervention in, uh, in Iraq. Now the optimists on the other hand, on the other hand, and I just cite in the, in the slide just uh, one example, Abdul Aziz Sashadina, argue that we can reinterpret Islamic traditions and scripture to produce liberal democracies that find authentic accommodation of faith and politics. Uh, 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 this is just one name, but in, in that whole spectrum of efforts, uh, you find people who say we have to look again at scripture and how scripture is interpreted. We have others who call for the historization of, of, of Islam, and we have others that uh, uh, say that you know, part of the answer maybe lies in looking at the ethical example and the ethical life of uh, the prophet. So I want to clarify something about the, Islam, his, about the Islamic uh, tradition or the Islamic experience. It is different from the Western. And in MENA societies were exposed to Western science secularism relatively late. In fact, they were not exposed to them until the contact with the domination of the West uh, and uh, culminating in the, uh, in the colonial experience. Uh, in classical Islam, uh, political power and religious authority overlapped. It did not necessarily fuse. The, 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 the people who, um, who engaged in, in jurisprudence and the people who led the Ummah politically were not necessarily the same. But they were basically all subjected to uh, the necessity to follow uh, the Sharia as uh, Wa'il Halaq another example would uh, articulately uh, uh, express it. So secularism therefore carries a different connotation in the Islamic context. At no moment was there a, uh, the thought that uh, uh, the problem was in, in, in Caesaropapism out of Rome uh, and hence you know, all the debates that led and all the political dynamics led to the reformation movement in, in, uh, in Christianity. Uh, uh, very simply to, 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 to say one more phrase on this, basically you had the whole space of uh, decisions, you had on one axis basically societal decisions and you had on one axis the transcendental relations with God, means worshipping and so forth. And all this, this area was subject to, uh, the, uh, to the advice, and more than the advice to the, actually, you can even say fatwas or edicts of the ulama. And even the caliph himself had to conform to these. So at no point was the, was the caliph himself uh, you know, uh, exempt from this law, and hence you did not have, uh, you didn't have the same revolt against uh, political authority uh, on this basis of separation of religion and politics. So, on that, you know, what is 
what is uh, uh, basically, you know, my uh, my uh, my approach and the approach in this book. My approach in this book saying, look, what if we were to look at politics before theology and not theology before politics? Let's not talk about, you know, whether Islam is compatible or incompatible, or whether uh, 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 you know it's just a question of interpretation. We have to look at politics before theology. And, but we still had to investigate this question very, very thoroughly. Because if, if, if Islam is incompatible with democracy, then we have a problem. No matter what happens, at the end of the day, there will, no, there will be no transition to democracy. So let's look at that very carefully. And if we look at politics before theology, uh, we see that the, the nexus, the, neolog the theological question then will take generations to resolve. It just cannot be uh, resolved overnight. And in fact, it will never be resolved because there's always uh, many sides to one issue and it can go on and, 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 and on and on again. But in real world scenarios, regardless of interpretive struggles about Islam, moments of political transition, due to human actors, make immediate choices, they happen. And in fact, the Arab Spring is a perfect example of this. Politics erupted onto the scene in a very strong way, and in fact, uh, made a forced entry into the political and religious spheres. And uh, it was about politics, and it was about religion now. So that spurred my thinking a little bit, and now we have the landscape, what are the basic elements of our, pa of our puzzle? In Arab Spring-style revolutions, this is a, 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 the observation, or one of the observations I came to. Uh, the Ancien Regime suffers popular breakdown and ruling, ruling elites disband. But they always return back to the future. They lurk, they lurk in the background, but always reconstitute and come back. In MENA, during such transitions, two political forces compete for power. Islamists and secularists, and each has an incompatible vision for political order. Uh, that is the whole. That is an essential question: Are have these were these transitions, or were they only successful insurrections? In so far as they destabilized incumbent elites, but the fundamental, but the regime stayed the same. That's part of the question this book tries to answer too. Therefore, the salient cleavage in political transition, for me, concerns the role of Islam in shaping law, power, institutions, or the lack of it. Secularists would say no, religion should stay far, while Islamists, or even conservative sectors of the society, which would not consider themselves necessarily Islamists, but are fundamentalists in their life, devout Muslims, consider that no, Islam has to remain in the public uh, in the public sphere and the decisions in politics have to be inspired by Islam. And the post Ben Ali Tunisia and post Mubarak Egypt are cases that illustrate these dynamics. As Larry said, they, are, they were the two uh, emblematic uh, political transitions or aspiring political transitions of the Arab Spring. And until very recently, they, one could say one of them was on the, uh, the path towards success and the other uh, quickly on uh, failed. So a pairing, you know, a pairing comparison or a comparing study was pretty much uh, in order. And here I decided you know, to look, to dig a little in the whole uh, transitology literature about pacted uh, democracy, impacted uh, pathway to democracy. So as you know, as a, as a, as a refresher, uh, pacted, given stalemated conflict, theories of pacted democracy uh, from comparative political science in the 80s and 90s offered a way forward through a mechanism of pacting or bargaining. Pacting refers to a negotiated bargains between ferocious rivals, such as Islamists and secularists, who, uh, whose only other alternative is to perpetuate intractable stalemate and even risk uh, mutual demise. And herein lies one of my contributions. Up until now, uh, pacting was thought of uh, on, on ideological terms, uh, left versus right, and not 
and not so much on the normative scale of religion or no uh, religion. So herein lies the contribution. I said, well, you know, if this worked with the left and right divide, why, why can it not be uh, investigated and why can it not be applied to this religious divide? Elections and democracy are least worse options and even destructive and even dist distrustful competitors can learn mutual toleration <coughs> and subject their political claims to institutionalized certainty. So this is basically this, the theory towards pacting and just as a refresher, these are the historical pacted democracies uh, that have basically punctuated the 80s and 90s, and these have chosen examples of the most emblematic. Of course, South Africa between the ANC and uh, and the uh, and the and the and the, and the, the white supremacy movement. Uh, it was also, even if it was around race and uh, uh, the emancipation of uh, of, uh, of the black population, it was still couched in, 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 in a discourse about economics because uh, blacks were being suppressed and they were deprived of their rights. Here you have Chile, of course, it says 1989, but in fact it started way before, I meant to say 79. And uh, paradoxically, here's one transition where the, uh, where the, um, the institutionalization uh, inaugurates the process of transition. So the, the, ref, the transition began, began with the referendum of 79. It was a consultation that started or ushered in the democratic era. Of course, you have Spain, a very emblematic case, which, uh, which involved not only democracy versus fascism, but in a sense, the restoration of monarchy. And it was very important in the European context. So very, very, very briefly, since most of you know this, how does pacting begin? Pacting holds that in a transition or before a transition, essentially you have two, two bargaining uh, parties at the table. They are the left-wing opposition and the right-wing regime. Uh, and it is moderates on the left and softliners within the regime and the military and security apparatus that begin the pacting process by talking uh, to them by talking to each other. And needless to, rem to remind you that pacts are sometimes in, in a third way, they were either uh, secret, they were, e they were either secret, they could be or open, like in Spain, or they could be, um, they could be uh, uh, convened uh, more officially, structured, like in the case of Spain with the secretariat and with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with personnel basically political personnel and figures managing it, they can be open or they can be completely uh, discreet. Uh, so how does pacting work? Very briefly again, in this case, uh, I'll let you read the, read the bullet points. Islamists and, and, seculars, and seculars agree to tolerate one another through elections, power sharing, constitutional compromise. Now, I want to say that Toleration is not tolerance. Toleration is about accepting the rules of the game in terms of laws, in terms of procedures, democratic procedures, where tolerance is, is, is more. Tolerance is internalizing the anthropological acceptance of the other philosophically. That can come down the law, down the, down, down the street. We're talking only about toleration. We're talking about agreeing on laws and on a roadmap. And in comparative perspective, democratic pacts become likely under three conditions. Uh, this, up until now, is all the theory as it's been developed, elaborated on, debated on by uh, all the literature, which you know much of it happened here, you know, with Philip Sch uh, Schmitter and uh, later critiqued and discussed and elaborated on with Larry and Mike McFall, all are here and applied to other regions. So I'm not reinventing the wheel. It's, it was not about reinventing the wheel. It was on the contrary, departing on this foundation so that it can, it can be a contribution, an extra contribution that comes after exhuming the transitology uh, literature and uh, 
uh, and adding another or adding another caveats and elements to it. So the first uh, condition is about acute ideological polarization. The second is about parity between rivals. And the third one is about normative dissension. I put in the word there acute because it's not severe. If you have severe, then you have civil war. In the case of Algeria, you had severe, severe polarization between the Islamists and the military, and that led to civil war. Of course, that's also the story about uh, FARC and uh, Guatemala to think across setting. Uh, power, a parity of power is pretty clear. And in fact, you don't have to have real parity. All you need to have is one actor that has enough veto power and everyone to know that this cannot continue for you for you to have inducement to sit down and bargain. And then you have normative dissension. It's about uh, deciding. We all know where we want to go, but people may differ on how we need to go there. Shall we have presidentialism? No presidentialism. Shall we have federalism? No federalism. It's about these normative dissensions, and there are many, there are many that can, that can uh, come up in a, in, a, in, a, in a transition. So the theory goes that pacted democracies are not perfect, but they become habituated over time, and democracy emerges, you know, as we've seen in the, uh, in the uh, third wave. Ironically, democracy through pacts is about the first initial or inaugural act is undemocratic. It's about sitting behind closed doors and talking and agreeing on things with everybody else uh, not seeing it. But from this emerges uh, democracy, and we've seen a lot of success stories, and Spain is a resounding uh, success story. So why are pre-pacting conditions uh, matter? Polarization, parity, and normative dissensions are necessary to create the deadlock. Paradoxically, the more deadlock there is, the more inducement there is to bargain. However, it doesn't mean, or it doesn't preordain on the chances of success of the transition. Uh, that, to a large degree, will depend on the background conditions, on structural factors of each particular country. <coughs> So this is a critical juncture that forces uh, rivals to recognize the logic of pacting. They've internalized the, the three factors, and they see that the only way out uh, from, uh, from stalemate or even mutual destruction, as we shall see in the case of Tun Tunisia, is to pact. Now, the normal question that, that comes up or will come up or comes up in my, uh, what came up in my mind was, uh, well, when... This happened in the 70s, this happened in the 80s and 90s, but what happened then in the 90s and, and 2000s? Why has transitology or pacting a theory completely disappeared from the scene? Where, where, where did these 20 years go? And here we can take a look at, you know, at the color revolution. And we can see immediately from the color revolutions why this is not going to happen in our region. And let me begin this slide by, by, by encouraging you first to look at one. This, the, the middle bullet point is the bullet point you should begin articulating the idea with, and then this one, and then this one. In, <coughs> in the current revolution, you had essentially you had essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union, so the collapse of the empire, the 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 singular party or the one party regime could not no longer uh, subsidize or bankroll all these regimes everywhere in, in the region and thus these regimes finding themselves basically on the limb collapse and you had kind of revolutions and a lot of the intermediary step to these color kind of revolutions before democracy was competitive authoritarianism that is these dominant elites organized themselves because they were the successive incumbents or the successors to uh, the one-party regime. And they basically styled their uh, regimes according to the one, uh, one, one party which now they controlled. But of course, that left a space. That left a space and left a space for uh, contestation. It left a space for, uh, for revolt, for, 
for uh, pushing your, your agenda. And again, this is not what happened in our region. Most of our regions in the MENA are hegemonic autocracies. They will not allow these spaces to emerge, and they have not allowed these spaces to emerge. So I have always asked myself this question, why wait till the last minute if you can introduce a little liberty or a little, just a little freedom, not democracy, but a little freedom. Doesn't it make more sense for the regimes than to play it until the end? Apparently, no, it's not in their software. I mean, I can't, that's, that's the only answer I have. So it's theoretically possible, but it's empirically, it has never happened. All the regimes will basically stay, 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 then they play it till the end. Mubarak, if you remember, did not name a vice president until the last week. So if we're to follow this, then the, the, the hegemonic autocracy, then they stay till the very end until they have a revolt. Now, here, this is the legacy of the Cold War. This is the legacy of the post-colonial struggle where certain elites have come to power and have stayed. <coughs> it has to do with the state formation of these countries. So in hegemonic uh, autocracies, there is no electoral opening for incremental change. Revolutions are massive, sudden, and intent on imposing new order. This is when you have the first uh, open competition for power or the open confrontation between Islamists and secularists. So, my argument is this, and this is very different than what you saw in Latin America. You have the transition, you have the rupture, as in Tunisia or in Egypt, Ben Ali goes, Mubarak goes, and then you have political deadlock between Islamists and secularists. That's, that's the first thing that comes up to the surface, because you have two, the, two most, the, the most salient uh, framework about the future worldview, religion or no religion, and then you have mutual recognition that this will take to mutual demise, and you have the beginning of pacting, and then you have the, 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 the democratic transitions begin. But it can, it can come back again after the first pact to another deadlock, and then it can, the cycle can begin again. Of course, more than two cycles is a bad sign. That means it's an elite affair, and that means that you know, this is becoming a, uh, uh, you know, as the Italians would say, a combinazione between, between elites. And also what I want to say is this is a story about power sharing in the future. It's not a story about extrication. Whereas in Latin America, it's a story about extrication. Regime military and they know that it's about negotiating a way to leave power. They can come back afterwards through elections, but it's about leaving, it's about uh, escaping uh, you know, prosecution, it's about uh, uh, you know, keeping intact your family and your so forth, and leaving, leaving with honor. This is not the story about the Middle East in MENA. This is a story about staying in power and sharing, and sharing power. And even if the regime elites are stifled or in awe because of the rupture that happened, they will, they will lurk in the, big, in the background because they're in the administration, because they're in the political sphere, remember that post-colonial uh, legacy, and they will come back reconstituted under another banner. So I'm gonna go through the Tunisian uh, transition and I'm gonna go through in brush strokes uh, because it, you know, this is an intense two years or three years that happened and we cannot go through all the events. We're just gonna go through the major events that take place. Ben Ali goes, the opposition emerges in the, in the name of the Nahda, CPRE, and the Takatun. Remember, the Nahda was the Islamist party led by uh, Hanoushi. Hanoushi was in exile. He comes back with a lot of the cadres. Uh, and then you have, essentially, these two regimes in 2010-2011. In this, in the early, in the early years, in the early months of the transition, essentially had uh, all actors fearing so much a return of the, of, the, of the Ancien Regime that they just did everything to talk about this and, 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 and jumpstart the process. There were no conflict, very little conflict <coughs> emerged from 2000, uh, 2000, January 2011 till the first election in the, uh, in the, uh, in, 
the National Assembly, which was held towards the end of 2011. Then you have the first instance of fascism. You had this group of TPR and Takatu, which are the secularists. They were one, on one side of the spectrum, and Mahda and Islamists and secularists at, this, at, the, at the spectrum. And then in 2011, after everybody saw that in Nahda won, the Ancien Regime mm -hmm. is finished, then you had the beginning of real serious friction. And here, three questions, three questions uh, uh, were posed. Blasphemy, the Islam in the, in the Constitution? What, what role will Islam have in, 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 the, in the articles of the Constitution? Two, uh, the role of women, blasphemy, and when I say Islam, I mean Islam and Sharia. Because Islam was both named as a, as a broad overarching principle and Sharia as a source of legislation. And uh, blasphemy and the role of women. And on these three, on these, all these questions, you had basically the divide was very clear. You had the Islamists wanting strong reference to, to, to Islam and, 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 and Sharia. The role of women was going to be complementary to men, that is safeguarding the family cell and so forth. And you had blasphemy, no blasphemy. While the others you had looked said, no, Islam cannot be uh, named, cannot be mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, blasphemy is about freedom of speech, and the woman has to be the equal of men. So you had all this conflict, and keep in mind that in the National uh, uh, Assembly, uh, al Nahda had a majority, real clear majority. But uh, on these three issues, al Nahda conceded territory, relinquished. The fallback was the article of the Constitution that was under Bourguiba, and that said that uh, Tunisia is uh, an, an Islamic country, uh, and Islam is the reference, not meaning uh, to the state, whether it was is, uh, Islam was, 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 in, was, lied, was, was linked to the nation or it was linked to the state. And that amb ambiguity, everybody could read whatever they wanted in that ambiguity. So it was a compromise. Basically, a Nahda gave in. It gave in concerning women, that there will be no, no mention of complementarity in the, in the Constitution. And it gave... It gave uh, also, it, it acquiesced concerning blasphemy. So you tell me, intuitively or otherwise, why would a party that has won undeniably an election and with a majority, why would it uh, relinquish or why would it acquiesce on its raison d'être, which are these? And the question is clear, it's to survive, it's not to destroy, mutually destroy oneself because the other side had enough power to basically you know, put uh, the, whole, uh, the whole process in danger. Plus, let us not forget that there was also the specter, which is very present in our minds, the specter in our minds when I'm talking about citizens from the Maghreb, and the specter of Algeria, the civil war of Algeria. So that goes through. Then in 2013, Again, brush, uh, a broad uh, uh, brush stroke, 213, you have incredible tension due to the Salafists. In, in February, in that year, you have the assassination of two, uh, two leaders, one was Shukri Bil Eid, and the other gentleman, I forget his name right now. Uh, there was that assassination, and uh, Al-Nahda was being accused of using the Salafi movements as the Trojan horse behind which to, to muster uh, to muster all the, the, the strength it can get, a reservoir of Islamists and so forth. Uh, but we will see later on, here there was a rupture. That rupture was overcome by the quartet, and again, uh, it all, it, 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 the, the Islamists again backed down. I'm going to fast forward to, to 2000, and I'll talk later. Nida Tunis and in the run for elections after the elites of the, of the Ancien Regime, uh, uh, which, which, which belonged to the Ben Ali Neo Dostour and the party, basically uh, the RCD, uh, basically organized under the banner of Midat Tunis under the leadership of, of, of Bejir Qaysisi, and they ran for elections, and here Midat Tunis won. What does Midat Tunis do? And this is, this is a, 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 a title, what does Midat Tunis do? Midat Tunis 
literally uh, extends its hand and invites al Nahda into the governing coalition. Why does it do it? It had one. Again, the specter of Algeria. Fear of mutual demise. And there was another thing also. There were, everybody was winning in this, in this transition by showing a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, a fruitful and productive pathway. The international community was uh, uh, rewarding uh, Tunisia for these bold steps towards democracy. Not enough, in my opinion, but that's another story. So, with that in mind, I'm going to very quickly go to the bullet points. I explained it, what happened before. Following the 2011 elections in Nahda and the leftist secularists and CPR that had to engage in coalition building. During 2013, as I explained, the Troika Islamist Secularist Coalition Pact, various agreements to, to avoid breakdown and disagreement. And Nahda abandoned most of its religious demands over these issues and compromises over the constitutional framework. Now that's pact number one. As I put it, you remember, as I put it, it's pact number one. Uh, uh, now, the second stage of pacting. Remember, the second stage of pacting comes after two th 2013 and 2014. A second crisis erupts, as I was talking about, the Salafism uh, eruption on the scene and, and, the, and the murders of the activists. And then you have basically almost a breakdown in 2013. You have a breakdown, and which warrants the uh, the uh, or induces the quartet to uh, to intervene and to basically uh, bring both to the table again. This is a picture which I am sure Larry will remember. It's the first picture of Beji Khalifati and Hanoushi meeting together. And ladies and gentlemen, it was happening under the auspices of CDDRL and the ARD program. We had a conference in Tunisia, and these two were invited, and they wanted to come and talk. And they basically refused to talk to each other, but finally, after they both called, they got up, shake hands, we were, we, were, we were there in the picture, in the front page. So under the auspices of, uh, you know, of uh, Larry, Lina Khatib, and myself. Well. Afterwards, the quartet got a Nobel Prize, but I was deported from Tunisia. <laughs> and I was deported from Tunisia literally afterwards. But anyway, I don't know. Well, I, I didn't expect a Nobel Prize, but still. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, so I want to, to say one last thing again. Here, just here before, when it got really ugly between these two in the second, in the second crisis, it got really ugly. What does Hanoushi do? This is after 2.30. Not only he gets it back into debate, he says, look, I am going to leave government. I'm going to leave government. Name, uh, name and Nahda leaves government. Let a technocratic, you know, or a technocratic or uh, a, a, a caretaker cabinet uh, run the country. I'm leaving government. I don't want to monopolize this thing. This is not about monopolizing power. He leaves. In 2014, he does something even more. And Nahda does something even more. This is the second pacting. The first pacting round was about identity issues. The second uh, round was about institutions and political figures and how the institutions should look. And here, he does something even more bold. The, is the Islamists never wanted, and in all these countries, Islamists never want uh, uh, presidential systems because they know that in presidential systems, they will lose presidential elections. At the, at the level of presence. That's why they want parliamentary systems. The opposition wanted a, pre, par, a, pre, a, a, a parliamentary system, a presidential system, I'm sorry, too. So what, what happens? They compromise. And they compromise, and, Nah, and nah that accepts a semi-presidential system. So he compromises on that. He does more than that. He accepts that the members of the Ancien Regime come and join politics. While Takatu and CPR refused to see the old <coughs> members of the old regime. So it's an example of, pact, of, of pacting working. When uh, Beji Khaid comes to power and wins the elections, as I said, he extends his arm on the other side of the, uh, of the aisle and Nahda joins the government. Again, the inducements were avoiding mutual, uh, mutual uh, destruction, even if they are institutions, this is still fresh, there's no consolidation. And also, 
you know, continuing the praise and the recognition that the international community was giving Tunisia, and rightfully so. Not enough of that, but this is the story. Uh, bear with me, we still have five minutes uh, to go through Egypt, uh, 10 minutes. So, from electoral democracy to backsliding. After 2019, we have uh, Qais Saeed, who basically comes to power, and so everybody says, well, you know, after all, the transition didn't work. And my argument is, no, this is a failure of consolidation. It's not a failure of the transition itself. It's a failure about elites, you know, sinking roots into, uh, 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 sinking the, the roots of democracy and habituation into the political system. He emerges, of course, you know the story, and the textbook is all written, it's taken from Victor Orban and everywhere, and basically it's about populism, the people are virtuous, it's the elites that are rotten. Let's do away with the elites, let's do away you know, with these, uh, with, with these uh, parliamentary uh, elections, let's invoke only those mechanisms of consultations that are vertical. That means we can do referendums and spot elections when I choose, etc. Everything that will enforce is my power and does away with everything that has to do with countervailing powers, accountability mechanisms, oversight, everything that's in a functioning democracy, separation of branches. And while we were at it to make sure it sticks, uh, we'll, we'll attack, you know, we'll prevent people and, uh, and, and the press from doing its job and we'll also make sure the judges are well aligned with our, with our, uh, with our, uh, you know, with our lives. This is not a book about populism, but pop populism features in it because there's a slide towards populism. And if you ask my opinion, this won't hold in Tunisia for a variety of reasons, but that, that's another story. So again, it is a critique of, of failures of consolidation, not of the transition itself. We come to Egypt, and here it is. And Conveniently, it's not because, but also I organized it that way to show it. It's a case of also two, it's uh, contrary to, uh, to Tunisia, it's a case of two, two failed uh, pacting rounds. The first one in 2011, the second one in 2000, and the uh, second one, the first one in 2011, the second one in 2012. Here you see what's happening, the Mubarak regime the demise of the Moroccan of the, of the, of the Mubarak regime, you have the Egyptian military taking power, and you have essentially the opposition or the alternative forces of society emerge in the, in the, in the party with the Muslim Brotherhood and the secularists, there are many, <coughs> which call for a, a, a civil state. Now here, it's, a, it's the same story, basically. As soon as the revolution happens, People coalesce together. They don't want the ancien regime to come back. We did away with it, now they coalesce. We st stick together and uh, let's, let's start and debate the new, uh, how the new, the new order should look like. Uh, so here it's a, it's a story about failed pacting. And uh, uh, why did it fail? It failed because the military, and here I grappled a lot about this. I, it, you know, is this, is this really an issue about the military? You know, what do we do with tutelary forces in this, uh, in this uh, order? If there's a tutelary force like uh, the military or like a regime, then, or like a, a monarchy, what, why is it that Islamists and secularists are, you know, the pacting party? Well, because for me, even if there's a tutelary power that, that holds, even if there's a tutelary entity that holds power, when the transition begins, there is enormous pressure on that tutelary force to concede to, to a new game and to, to defer or to give a mandate constitutionally for uh, pol political parties in society to compete between themselves. And when that happens, almost systematically, you will have uh, Islamists and uh, secularists divide. So that's how I resolve that problem, and I argue it. You know, I think in all modesty, uh, you know, I, 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 I adroitly in, in 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 the book. So when this happens, 
the military, the military, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and the military agree to push through a constitution without consultation, without sequence, and without being a, a participatory process. What do they do? The first thing the military does, or the first thing the Muslim Brotherhood does, is enshrines the prerogatives of the military in the constitution, and also does everything to maintain Sharia and Islam in the constitution. Now, why does the Muslim Brotherhood do it? Do it? Because, in my opinion, one of the flaws of this transition is the fact that there is norm normative diversity, there is ideological polarization, but there's no parity. Parity is the biggest lacking variable, and essentially you have the Muslim Brotherhood, and you have a, a basically a disequilibrium, and you have the Muslim Brotherhood, who sees in the military the only threat. And since these two actors have a symbiotic relationship, they've been together contrary to Nada, who's been in exile and tormented and in jails like most of his secularist counterparts, the Muslim Brotherhood, no, the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, basically uh, uh, a symbiotic actor that knew very well the, uh, the military. They are two political animals that knew each other very well. Remember, uh, Nasser uh, uh, drew much of his, 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 uh, his support from the Muslim Brotherhood uh, when he installed his regime, even afterwards he turned against them. The same thing with Mubarak. At one point, he brought them into the game and tolerated them precisely because they were going to oxygenate his regime when being co-opted. So these are two actors that knew each other. The Muslim Brotherhood did the basic big mistake was that and it accommodated the military and only the, the military on these key issues. So you have the Muslim Brotherhood coming into power basically leading the transition, a very aggrieved but a very fragmented civil society because it was weaker than elsewhere. And it was weaker elsewhere because it was organizationally weaker, but it was also uh, uh, weaker because Islam held a stronger role in society, uh, played a, more, a stronger role in society uh, in, in Egypt than in Tunisia. So that pushes us forward to the second phase and the second failure for me is situated uh, uh, about in 2012. We're going to fast forward to, to the summer of 2012, where uh, now you have this constitution done, but you have uh, uh, parliamentary elections. The Muslim Brotherhood wins. The Muslim Brotherhood wins. And uh, quickly after, Morsi wins the presidential elections. But what happens here? It was bound to happen because it's it was, it was this, this, this equilibrium, and the military were not, from the beginning, uh, taught that there was a new game in town, so basically continued with their, own grievance, with their own reflexes. The Muslim Brotherhood wins in the summer of 2012 a major, uh, a major electoral victory in the majority, and now the military starts fearing, sees the, sees the Muslim Brotherhood as uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this actor that is going to get hegemony and disfigure our state and basically take from us the role of guardian of the state. Uh, 2013, 2012, another major mistake uh, on the heels of the, of the, of the, of the electoral uh, parliamentary election, on the heels of that, is that they feel the candidate to run for the election when they had promised not to enter into a presidential election. And that basically scared everybody else. And when you ask them, they said, well, we feel it like I did in Cairo when I, when I saw them in Cairo and Qatar. And they all said, well, it's because you know, we were in a corner and we had to defend ourselves. And the military uh, basically was pushing Ahmed Shafiq, uh, a figure, emblematic figure of the ancien regime and so forth. So when, the, when all this happened, the military then to, to basically abort this, uh, uh, created a, a, a asked or, or engineered essentially the annulment of the existing parliament. And at that point, one thing led to another. Uh, you, had, uh, uh, you had basically what was happening here was that the, the secularists were worried and were asking the military to, to, to stop and to cease this, <coughs> to put a halt to this experiment. And you had Morsi digging himself deeper in a hole. The army was going to cancel the, uh, was going to annul the parliamentary <coughs> election through the constitutional court. Uh, he, he issued basically a presidential decree saying that 
my laws trump all other laws and my laws take precedent over anything else. So he's tried to basically legally kill or nip in the bud anything that was going to come out from other quarters by the military. You had also the state, the deep state, refusing to implement a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, and basically had, you know, what led to the military or civil society begging the army to intervene. So you had the, so, so you had this, uh, this, uh, the coup. But my, my, I want us to pay attention a little, a little bit to this. Had the Muslim Brotherhood really packed it more on, it's not, it's not about self-restraint if you have power, it's about acting strategically. Knowing that parity, there's no parity, size and strength is on your side. But had it really packed it with the, with the, with the secularists, the military could have come in, for sure. But it would have been much harder for the military to overturn the experiment and to basically put a halt to the experiment. So again, it's, it, it, it shows you know, why, the, why this, this, uh, this, this experiment didn't work, but also how it could have worked other, uh, you know, uh, otherwise. Now you, you may tell me, well, you know, uh, good, but how are we going to learn now? Well, there's always a next time. Because CC is, uh, is in trouble. CC may not have in mind a transition, but he may very well have a form of liberalization in mind when it becomes impossible for him with the IMF and so forth. And he may very well create a situation where there's more liberalization in the regime. And here, there's a learning curve. It's like in game theory, you know, this is a collective action problem. The Muslim Brotherhood, whoever comes next, can learn from this pre-experience. Nothing was preordained. This is not was a case, not a case where the Muslim Brotherhoods were set up to fail. It was a case where the Muslim Brotherhood exercised poor judgment and leadership. Uh, I am going to go to the last slide, and I'm going to take literally two minutes for this slide. So these are the key theoretical takeaways and what I, what I found or what I... Uh, you know, the conclusion I've been able to, to muster and extract from this work. This work exhumes and applies theories of pacting to the Islamist secularist divide. It does not <coughs> reimagine uh, uh, pacting theory as say, it just uh, uh, reapplies it to the MENA region. And uh, because again, Islamists and secularists represent the divide. And you may tell me, well, you know, they've, they've, they've performed so badly in the region, like, like in Morocco or elsewhere too. You know, what, why would you say that that divide will still emerge down the line? I say it will emerge because it's a failure of these type of Islamists. It's not a failure of Islamists, aspiring Islamists to come. The role of religion is still important in our region and the role of religion within the public sphere is something that many sectors of society want, and hence, like water, it will find a way to, its, to, to the lowest level. It will find a way to mandate certain elites and certain political forces to come and represent that pole of politics. So that's one finding. Pacts between Islamists and secularists are not about extricating dictators from power, unlike the third way. They're about power sharing agreements. <laughs> And even if elites you know, get disoriented and, and about thrown off balance, they find a way because of the legacies, because of existing legacies, they come a way to come back to power. Uh, revolution dynamics are less about the demise of old regimes as they are about expelling incumbents and neutralizing dominant elites as those elites often return in the guise of secular forces during the transition. Lastly, the determinants to successful pacts have nothing to do with prior secularism or Islamic tradition. This has nothing to do with what the faith said. The faith is about scripture, it's about, it's about interpreting text. It has to do about institutional conditions that make political actors survive and have a role in the future. And lastly, and I want to reinforce this, 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 this point, is by telling you that a byproduct of this, I have found, is theolo theolo theological production. I hate to use 
the word byproduct because it's, it's a lot from economics for this is such a vital role. It's about the relationship with the prophecy. But one of the byproducts of this is precisely theological production, new theological uh, uh, findings. And I'm going to show you an example of that by going to the previous slide. Now you'll tell me after, and I've interviewed Nahda uh, Ghanoushis and Nahda on this. You know, I said, you're abandoning Sharia, you're abandoning you know, all this. How, how did you justify this to your troops? How, how did that happen? And he said, you know, very simple. I, I, I went to the theory in Islam, which is about maqasid, which is about the goals of scripture. And the goals of scripture is to preserve the ummah and society. And my ummah was not the community of the faithful. My ummah was the nation. Because Tunisians saw in 1861, which is the first constitution and citizenship, that the beginnings of the, the, the seed of citizenship, something that belonged to the Tunisian national repertoire. And leaving that to the side was going to work against the nation and threaten our nation. So here's a, a, a concrete case of theological production. And also, you know, uh, Tunisia's and Nahda justified separating its, its uh, spiritual wing from its political party with doctrinal revision. It's unthinkable for a political uh, Islamic party, you know, to, to do that, to come and say, well, you know, uh, the spiritual wing is not going to play a role anymore in, uh, in politics. Well, it's the raison d'être of an Islamist. It's to bring Islam at the center of the equation, and yet here, he, saying, no, you're going to stay behind and you're going to counsel people on the basis of religion and not on, on the basis of politics. How did he do that? He explained it by tahassus, meaning specialization for the, for, the, for the sake of advancing its akhlaq, for the sake of advancing the morals. The morals and the ethical example of the Prophet are better served that way, by getting out of political conflict and by this form of specialization. So there you have it. It's a theological interpretation. It's there. Generations in the future in the Muslim world can look at it and say, this is our, how we interpret uh, 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 scripture. Thank you very much. That's my talk. Thank you.